safe streets, vibrant neighborhoods, successful business and commerce. These are things that make a healthy community. We are a diverse community, rural, suburban, urban, a multitude of languages and ethnicities, ages and experiences. We are a collaborative community. Public-private partnerships make us a model community that others want to follow. It is what makes us unique. It is what makes us strong. The employees of Kent County reflect our diversity and seek to serve our communities. People in this county, in this area, we wrap our arms around each other. We come together to collaborate, to solve problems. Um, we're all working for the good of the whole. And I think that's wonderful. And you can see it. You can see it as you drive around Kent County. Our impact starts the day a baby is born and a birth certificate is issued, to protecting children from deadly diseases through vaccination, to the public safety and justice provided by law enforcement and the courts, to offering veterans services and caring for the elderly. Every day we work to keep our communities robust. I think if you are somebody who is interested in serving your community, in building a strong knowledge base and a good group of people to work with, then the county is one of your best employment opportunities out there. It's been completely rewarding in every way I could possibly explain for 26 years, and I feel like I grow every single day still today. Leading these dedicated employees are 19 member board of commissioners and our county administrator controller, along with our elected officials and appointed department directors, placing emphasis on civic involvement, quality housing, vibrant neighborhoods, and strong, solid infrastructure to allow businesses to thrive. Professional, dedicated, collaborative, and innovative. Behind the scenes, collaboration between foundations, charitable organizations, nonprofits, for-profit businesses, public sector demonstrated through the county, the city of Grand Rapids, the townships, all the cities and the villages in our area. If we don't come together, then we will not have the strength that we have today, and I only hope to build upon that. Our aim is to make our communities the best they can be. We are involved in exciting development projects, sustainable recycling programs, and creative progressive prevention programming. We partner with elected officials, impacting policy ideas that become great achievements. We seek opportunities to reach out into the community and offer our services to help our residents make Kent County thrive. Our relationship um, is solid, um, both from a staff standpoint at the county level, as well as the Board of Commissioners. And um, they understand what we do and the benefits that we can do for the community, and vice versa, we couldn't do what we do without the help of Kent County. While most of us are busy running our lives, Kent County's elected officials, administrator controller, and over 1,600 employees are serving the communities where we live our lives so we can all have a place we are proud to call home. Kent County, it's life well run. Good morning. It is Tuesday, June 13th. I'd like to open the Legislative and Human Resources Committee today. Uh, I'd like to open it with item number one, number one on our agenda, public comment. Is there any public comment today? Seeing none, we will move to item two, approval of the minutes. Do I have a motion? I'll move that, Madam Chair. Support. Commissioner support by Commissioner Vaughn. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Item three, Board of Commissioners amend section 6.2 of the standing rules. As you all may recall, uh, we had some rule changes that we were looking into and we this was brought up at our last meeting. Um, we've given commissioners several days to review any changes, submit any questions, uh, make sure that they're all set with any changes we have. And we have our board chair here today, uh, Commissioner. Chairman Southall to uh, give us some brief comments as well. Do I have a motion to a motion for item three? So moved. Right. Support. Support. Moved by Commissioner Breeby. Support by Commissioner Steck. Um, thank you, Chair, Madam Chair. Um, I was here today. By the way, hope you don't mind me sitting here. I am ex officio for all the committees, and I understand that uh, some of the past chairs 
while back, but used to sit at the committee meeting, so I thought it was better than standing at the podium. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to give you guys a background on this because it kind of was something that I flagged and, and pushed. Um, what I'm trying to do is reestablish what was in the rules prior to 2015, and that's that a, a, the board can adopt what the report says when a committee works on a report, submits a report. The board being, well, I should say either the committee or the board, depending on where the report comes from. Um, in the old rules prior to 2015, that the board, by way of example, may approve, uh, table, postpone, etc. the report. The key word there is approve. And so we did that in with uh, two very important reports that this board worked on. The first was the Community Collaboration Work Group, which was the old One Kent uh, <coughs> subcommittee uh, task force that included uh, uh, stakeholders from the community. And in the end, that was uh, probably one of the most important things that occurred in order to um, stop that movement. And I'll be very blunt, the county was not in favor of that movement. And uh, we saw a lot of concerns that weren't being addressed. And that was our way to sit down, spend over a year working on it with uh, important stakeholders from the community, such as the right place, the chamber, etc. And when we got done, we issued a report. The board of commissioners then adopted that report. Under the current rules, there, and I don't um, know the background, 2015, that right was removed from the rules. I suspect it was an oversight when that was done because I don't recall any discussion in 2015 on why we would want to remove that opportunity for a board or committee to adopt a uh, subcommittee report. Um, and I know we did do some restructuring of how that whole section looked in that year, so I'm just assuming that that maybe was an oversight. It would have been great if, if we had flagged that prior to, uh, while the subcommittee this year, the rules he was working on it, and I know that was a question raised at your last meeting, but the reality is I didn't notice this until I got a question on the friend of the court report and whether the board would adopt, be willing to adopt that, and I started looking at the rules, and that's when I pieced it together that this important provision that had always existed in our rules in the past suddenly was not there anymore. And so, uh, yes, it would have been great to uh, get to it back then, but uh, it was something that did not come to light until then. So, um, I, I, so what you have before you is a change that puts back that right. Specifically, it talks about uh, item four, request a motion to adopt the report and, if applicable, refer specific recommendations to the appropriate standing committee uh, for further action. Um, there were a few tweaks on this report, or on this uh, proposed language from the last one you looked at, and that was, I think, as a result of some uh, discussions I had with Commissioner Steck. He raised some very good uh, some uh, some uh, ways to update this, and we did that. Um, and so, hopefully, this language uh, uh, is is good with the committee. It certainly gives puts back, in my opinion, it restores that right that the committees and the boards always had to adopt a report. Let me just end then by saying why I think not having that in the, in the rules is, really hurts us. Number one, it's hard sometimes to find stakeholders to sit at a, at a table and meet for a potential year on an important issue. We've done this now with the, I did it, with the, I chaired both the Community Collaboration Work Group and then the Agribusiness Work Group, which is also a report that the board adopted. Um, both reports, in my opinion, very important. Both reports had stakeholders from the community in it. And, and both reports, uh, both uh, examples, I think, demonstrate where if I go to somebody and say, hey, would you be willing to serve on, a, on this important task force? And in the end, the board can't even adopt the report. They're going to say, well, why am I going through all the uh, hassle of, of meeting every month and working through these things? So I think it could be hard for us to find stakeholders if we don't restore that language. Uh, second, I, I do think uh, it, it adding the ability to adopt the report formalizes the report because otherwise it's just received and filed and by the rules, <coughs> received and files has no force and effect. If we have a report 
take the front of the court uh, a report, for example, when that comes in, if we want to say, yeah, we adopt these recommendations, uh, you know, it'd be nice to take the report and say, here's a report that the whole co uh, Board of Commissioners of the uh, Kent County Board of Commissioners adopted, as opposed to just saying, well, here's a report that was received and filed by the county. Uh, and then, and then third, I think that um, there are s the the other option that existed uh, without this was that there could be uh, additional discussion or referring a recommendation to a standing committee for review. In my opinion, that only addresses part of what could happen when a report comes back. Uh, maybe there is no more discussion that needs to be happen occurring and maybe there is nothing more for a standing committee to do but maybe there are things that we want to uh, note are, are a recommended result in a uh, particular report that we want the community to know that the Board of Commissioners is behind. So for all those reasons um, I think it's really critical and it's, uh, hopefully it was just an oversight when that got removed but I think important that we restore that right to the rules. That's what this revised section 6.2 does and uh, I thank you for the time Madam Chair. Okay, Mr. Chair, are there any questions or discussion on this issue? Um, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I definitely um, uh, like this move, and and also on our process pile to remember to have that education with those folks beforehand, like what what would could happen with these reports, whatever it's worth. Um, Commissioner Lanier, who hangs out in the building next door, uh, City of Grand Rapids Commission. She just assumed that the front of the court advisory stuff was basically just going to be the marching orders to front of the court and, and staff. And I said, well, that's not, not exactly how we do things over at the county. That it def definitely there are the recommendation for this is like the first milestone. It's not the last milestone for marching orders. So again, just so we're really clear on what's going to happen with this, what could happen with it, both to recruit good people and that people have the right expectations. So, thank you. Commissioner Steck. Thank you. Uh, under the rule, uh, no report even comes back to the board for consideration unless it meets uh, this requirement. It must have specific recommendations for action. I continue to think that it is those recommendations for action that are the most critical part of any report. Um, but I'm also convinced that there are circumstances in which the adoption of the substance or the argument, if you will, that stands behind those recommendations uh, may also be the appropriate focus. Um, I continue to think that we ought to stay focused as much as possible on recommendations because that's where the action is. Um, but uh, I accept that this is an appropriate way to, uh, to address this issue. Commissioner Yeah, I agree with, uh, with Commissioner Saalfeld and Bulkadek. I think this is... Uh, um, some good work here. I just would note, and I, not knowing the history, that this does give a, an awful lot of uh, power and prerogative uh, to the chair of the standing committee or the board, um, which certainly makes sense, but would uh, hope that uh, as we go into this session that, um, and we receive some of these reports, that, that those chairs are sure to consult uh, informally and formally with other board members. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I don't have a problem with this at all. The problem and the discussion that came out was that we did the standing rules and then this is sort of a Johnny Come Lightly thing. And we've never done that in the uh, 16 plus years that I've been here. And I, I don't think we want to see that as a habit. Dan mentioned that uh, last meeting about uh, that same issue and sort of circumvented some of the committee work as I understood it. And for me, as far as this, I have no problem with whatsoever. But I don't think we want to have it of redoing the rules uh, after we make the initial decisions. I don't disagree. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion or questions on this issue? All right, all in, uh, do you want to read this in or are we good? Yeah. All in favor of, uh, of uh, item three, amending section 6.2 of the standing rules, say aye. 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 All opposed? All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. All right, on to item four, Sheriff Foundation Plan.
This is a request to recommend to the board to adapt the updated hazard mitigation plan as an official plan and submit it to the Michigan State Police Emergency Management Division and Federal Emergency Management Agency Region 5 officials to enable the Kent County's hazard mitigation plan final approval. An adopted hazard mitigation plan is required as a condition of future funding for mitigation projects under multiple FEMA pre- and post-disaster mitigation grant programs, Michigan State Police Emergency Management Division and the Federal Emergency Management Agency Region 5 officials have reviewed the updated hazard mitigation plan and approved it contingent upon this official adoption. The sheriff recommends adoption of the plan. So moved. Second. By Commissioner Corndike, seconded by Commissioner Skaggs. Any discussion? Any questions or comments on this issue? All right, all in favor of uh, the Sheriff's Hazard Mitigation Plan, say aye. 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 All opposed? Great. Item five, Medical Examiner Performance Measurement. We have here Dr. Um, Stephen Cole, who is our medical examiner. All right, Dr. Cole, come up, please. Okay, let's see here. We have a PowerPoint, and there are a few things I have to say here that are a little differently than, uh, than normal. So the overview uh, is uh, sort of self-explanatory. The main thing I'd say is our metrics, and we'll get going. So, let's see. So... Basically, our job as medical examiners is to investigate under the medical examiner law all violent deaths, so that's all uh, accidental, suicidal, homicidal deaths. And although drug overdose itself isn't violent, that certainly falls under our uh, responsibility. Um, and then sudden unexpected natural deaths. And uh, so I, ever, most of you have heard this stuff before, so I won't uh, bloviate too much about this part. But uh, of course, part of our job and the biggest part of our budget is topsies on cases that we deem necessary. So, um, and this kind of blends into uh, the mission statement, uh, blends into our overview. So uh, the main job of our department is uh, to, again, investigate the deaths that I've indicated under the medical examiner law. We have six lay investigators and one physician, Dr. Stark, who's also the deputy chief medical examiner. And uh, so uh, they will take calls from whoever uh, is in charge of the body. It's almost always going to be either the police or a hospital and gather information uh, and uh, the next uh, point uh, in the algorithm is that we, either Dr. Start or I, whoever's on call, decides uh, if there's gonna be an autopsy in the cases that are in, in any particular case and then to perform those autopsies. Uh, and then of course, part of our uh, job is court testimony when needed. Uh, and uh, less, well-recognized function of our department is to issue cremation permits, which are, is a pretty good uh, active business, I guess I'd say. And then uh, rarely, if someone wishes to move one of their previously buried relatives, we have to issue the permit for that uh, and then to rebury them. So, uh, specifically our goals first one. Um, so the, the reports that we generate, there are two primary reports. Whenever one of our investigators accepts a case, uh, they have to write a report. We, uh, for several years, have had an online uh, data information system called MDI Log. They have to enter uh, their report into this log and it's uh, nine total pages, which includes a lot of drop downs. So uh, the actual 
written report is often about a page, but there are lots of other demographic uh, fields that they have to fill out. So our goal is to complete 98% of these reports uh, within two months of the time they are reported to us, and uh, we have pretty consistently been uh, at that level, slightly above, usually about 99%. The reason they may not be completed is sometimes there's additional information needed that uh, the investigator just can't get or that um, if we have an unidentified person, we ask the help of the police department to track down a potential next of kin and that can take a while. But for the most part, our reports are completed um, on time and a little faster. Now. We are obligated to examiners to determine the cause and manner of death, uh, and uh, when we have to do an autopsy, and this is the, the one uh, field that uh, I'm going to expound upon just a little bit, uh, our autopsy completion goal <coughs> is uh, to complete autopsies within uh, three months of death, which might seem reasonable, and for some cases it is. Uh, we are not up to that uh, metric, uh, and I don't know forward if we're ever going to be, because and it says there were about 78%, I guess, for last year, almost 79 The reason is that uh, we have had, as everyone knows, a humongous uh, epidemic of drug overdoses. And it's not just the old, the, I guess what I'd call the good old-fashioned drugs, cocaine, heroin, oxycodone, and so on. Um, there's been a huge increase in fit, which is uh, many of you may be uh, familiar with in terms of, it's got some publicity, it's uh, been around for many years, uh, and uh, the last probably 10 or 15 years in the form of patches that, can, uh, that are legitimately used by patients who have pain and the patches go on the skin, so they're, they're, the drug is absorbed through the skin. And uh, what the initial problem we had with fentanyl is that people would uh, either uh, illegitimately obtain these and they would chew them. Mm. They would, uh, and still do, they'll soak them, get the fentanyl into solution and inject it. Uh, and sometimes they just use a lot of patches. I, I had one case where the gentleman was found dead. He had patches. A lot of them were cut up. They're usually about an inch and a half by an inch and a half squares with adhesive. This guy had cut them into many pieces, and I don't know how many he had, but he had them plastered literally all over himself. Uh, the genital region, on the soles of his feet, and had, of course, quite a high level of fentanyl, a lethal level, uh, when we did the autopsy. But, that's, but it's gone far beyond fentanyl. And for the past three or four years, at least, there have been uh, types of drugs called fentanyl analogs. So these are drugs with chemically the same structure as fentanyl, but they've added on some extra chemical groups. Many of them are produced in China and bought over the internet. And uh, probably the most famous fentanyl analog is fentanyl, known as an elephant tranquilizer, and it's something like a thousand times more powerful than heroin, and we've had one death that I know of in Kent County with that. It's, it's uh, uh, an enormous problem in uh, Ohio and, and western Pennsylvania. It seems to be moving slowly west. We've had one case here. We had another case from uh, Reed City, and I expect we're going to get more, and I think the drug teams have seized some uh, car fentanyl. But that's just one of many. Uh, other drugs are uh, furanyl fentanyl, al alpha fentanyl, uh, one uh, is U47700, and even though that doesn't have the name fentanyl in it, it's a fentanyl type drug that was originally developed by the Upjohn Company, hence the U, back in the 70s, and was found to be not acceptable, maybe because it was too powerful for uh, medical use, and so they developed it but then didn't use it. Well, the Chinese, at least some uh, manufacturers uh, in China, uh, gotten hold of many of these formulas and are producing uh, these drugs. And the problem that we have is that these fentanyl analogs are not routinely identified on our drug screen. So we have a very comprehensive drug screen that we use uh, out of the Spectum Tox Lab 
and it picks up about 550 or 600 drugs and chemicals. And so it used to be good enough for almost everything. Well, now what will happen is we'll have a young person with a history of usually heroin. They always, whoever's given says, well, he OD'd on heroin. Well, fine, sometimes they do. But uh, in many cases, we do our drug screen, we do a complete autopsy. There's no cause of death found in the autopsy. The drug screen's negative, but yet there's needles, syringes, uh, needle track scars on their arms and all the paraphernalia, other paraphernalia at the scene, uh, but yet it's a negative drug screen. Well, some of these are turning out to be caused by, probably almost all of them, by these fentanyl analogs. So um, we have another challenge that we've had, and we're, we've worked, particularly we've had pretty good luck with the Sheriff's Department and the Grand Rapids Police, is uh, a spoon or a syringe or a bag of powder will be covered at the scene. And of course, nobody knows what it is. The police now cannot field test this. They used to have be able to put a chemical on uh, the unknown substance and at least get some idea. But because of the concern about car fentanyl getting into the air and on the skin of uh, someone who's uh, doing the testing and the potential, or at least the concern, for a, an overdose just by incidental contact, because car fentanyl is so potent that um, they can't field test them. So we uh, often will request that the police agency uh, submit to our lab, or occasionally the state police lab uh, on Fuller, but we prefer it to our lab, for, for us to test. But all this takes a long time. It's usually three or four weeks at least for the toxicology, routine toxicology to be done. Uh, we get, uh, if it's negative, then we uh, do further investigation, either see, see if we can analyze for whatever powder or substance is recovered at the scene. Uh, we also have a reference laboratory that uh, we sometimes will submit uh, blood to from our patient that, ha that has an expanded uh, testing capability for some of these new drugs. But all that takes weeks and weeks. So a lot of that is uh, why we have seen this uh, decrease in our turnaround time. And the other less common problem is that we will sometimes have usually a young person found dead, either no medical history or no significant history. We do an autopsy, we find nothing. We do a drug screen, we get nothing. And some of those we suspect of, uh, as being caused by some molecular mutations uh, at the cellular level. Uh, and these mutations, some of them, can result in a tendency to fatal heart rhythm. There's no routine way to test for that. There is a research lab out in California that we have used that has a grant to look for these. It's called the Scripps Medical Institute in La Jolla. And uh, they will do this testing for free, so at least it doesn't mess up our budget. But it takes them months. So if we have one of those cases, uh, and it's very important to, deter to try to establish if they do have such a mutation because A, we certainly want to determine the cause of death and rule out other things, and the other thing is but then their family members have it. So we are trying to uh, do basically public health by doing that. But such testing takes a long time, and I had one case from Grand Rapids, it was from October, that they still haven't quite finished. I email them every so often and they say, oh, just any day now we'll, we'll get this result. So. Um, I would say that's the main reason for our suboptimal turnaround time, but it does tie into this national public health crisis that we, uh, uh, with overdoses, uh, that we're dealing with now. So I guess if there, are, uh, I think I have one or two more slides, but if there are questions about that, I could try to address them. Uh, on a happier note, how are we doing with regard to our response? That is, when one of our investigators is called. Uh, we want them to uh, get to the scene within an hour of being called, uh, and we've, uh, we're doing really well there, uh, a little over 95% for last year, and the prior years is pretty good too. Uh, one of the issues that may take longer sometimes is we have seven people, and uh, the arrangement that we have, because everyone's part-time, you can't make somebody take uh, cover, us, but you can't make one person be responsible for a particular <coughs> segment of time. So what happens is they rotate, and whoever's the last person to take a call is the last one up. The next person who's up, maybe it's Dr. Stark, he's in the middle of an autopsy, which is going on right now. If he gets caught, take it. So 
the exchange that we pay to find a medical examiner has to just go through the list and that can take a while. But despite that, we're doing pretty well with our uh, scene uh, investigations. Uh, obviously, every year it's a budget issue as it is for every department in the county. And uh, I'd say one of our main, uh, two of our main challenges, I'll just say generally because this isn't the budget committee, is uh, getting educational money. Our investigators, uh, because death investigation as any profession is constantly changing, there are courses around the country and there is a state medical examiner. We have a state medical examiner association that has a meeting in Mount Pleasant every year. But uh, my, my goal is to get, uh, at least every other year, have those people attending the meeting. But it's becoming harder because of uh, the budget. And then the other thing which it hasn't played out or will play out fairly soon is the spectrum for their the autopsy charge has the charge has increased their rates so then um, this came on fairly quickly so uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to deal with that um, accomplishments let's see here okay. Uh, so we are accredited by the National Association of Medical Examiners, which is the primary medical examiner organization nationally. We have a very strict, rigid process that we have to go through where they even send a site visitor or site inspector to come and go through our operation, uh, review our reports, look at things like turnaround time, and uh, we've been accredited I think for about the last seven or eight years continuously. Every five years we have an on-site inspection, which we had three years ago, so, uh, but in the, in, in the inter interim, every, every year we still have to fill out a form, uh, fill out quite a few uh, pages of documentation ourselves and submit it to the national office. It is kind of on our word, uh, but then we are actually uh, physically have a, uh, an inspector every four or five years. So we're pleased with that. I think there are 36, 37 medical examiner offices around the country uh, that are so accredited, but there's more of them that aren't. Um, we do have two medical examiner investigators who are certified through the American Board of Medical Legal Death Investigators. Uh, this is a pretty rigorous process as well. Uh, I initially wanted to require all of our investigators to have this certification. Uh, but I was told by HR, well, you can't because the law doesn't require it. But still, two of them have taken it upon themselves and the third one is underway. And what's going to happen is, uh, basically nationally, is that there, it will come to the point where the, everyone will have to be accredited. The, uh, the government um, uh, has, is ratcheting the death investigation and generally the forensic science community to try to improve performance, improve standards, and uh, require every uh, one involved to be certified uh, in, in death investigation. So we're underway. We still have a ways to go. Uh, another one that isn't on here, and I'm not sure why, but I think it's going to be maybe at a future board meeting, there's going to be uh, someone from Gift of Life, which is the Oregon Harvesting uh, Organization for me. Uh, they uh, well, they, have, they keep a record of all the donations that they get when somebody's died, uh, whether it's a solid organ. They also can take skin and bone for orthopedic and burn patients. They can, in, even in a, in a deceased person, uh, in some cases they can take the heart and cut out the heart valves and use those for heart valve for placement surgery. Uh, and so all those come from deceased individuals that are passed through medical examiner's offices and the number one uh, medical examiner office for the state of Michigan in terms of donations. Uh, that includes, uh, and we, we pass uh, way past Oakland County, which doesn't cooperate with them much, and uh, Wayne County. Uh, so though we're not the biggest office in numbers, uh, we uh, do provide the most uh, tissue uh, for uh, the gift of life people, and they're very happy about that, and they do spread the word about uh, our performance. And they have a, a marketing person or a representative that uh, I think is hoping to come to a, a future board meeting. 
And oh, I see. Okay. Well, this has changed since my copy. So here are some actual numbers from our gift of life uh, people. So uh, 40, uh, I, I, what I failed to say was uh, eye donors, what they do is they take corneas if they can, because people that have cataracts and so on um, will need a cornea transplant. And many, many people know, so they, that's also where they come from. So we, we've steadily increased from 110 in 2014 to 162 referrals. That's another issue that if someone has, I won't belabor it anymore, but if somebody has a particular uh, question about this, um, I can try to answer it. Um, collaborations. Of course, the health department is our main one because basically what we do, the way I look at it, is public health. It's kind of public death, but like hopefully it helps public health. And um, uh, we can see the three areas we do deal when we have a communicable disease. We report it to the health department, who reports it to the state, sometimes the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, we uh, provide information for several drug overdose uh, organizations and uh, have worked with the Suicide Prevention Agency. Of course, emergency preparedness. Last week I was uh, able to go to Michigan State to a disaster meeting where if this disaster, the state has a, uh, a system <coughs> called By Mort Michigan Mortuary. And basically what it means is if there's a mass disaster, they provide a, a, a trailer with a cooling, a refrigerated trailer or a reefer for cooling. And they have all these workstations with expertise uh, in den with, where they have uh, dentists, anthropologists, DNA expert, uh, scene recovery and family assistance, uh, and uh, we are a part of that, and uh, uh, so that's uh, one thing that happened just recently where there was an interaction between us and emergency preparedness. Obviously, law enforcement with all the agencies in Kent County and the state police and the prosecutor's office, and uh, not every, uh, not all of our contact with the prosecutor's office involves testimony, and oftentimes we'll have meetings and with them just to explain findings in a case and help them decide whether they uh, might uh, crush someone. Um, okay, looking ahead. Well, I'm probably the oldest one in the whole department, so we're all old. I'm the oldest, and uh, we don't. I, I don't have any plans to retire, but of course we all know. <laughs> Sometimes things happen anyway, but Dr. Stark would take over if something happens to me. Uh, but I do plan uh, several years ahead, at least a couple years ahead, to uh, let everyone know so we can start finding a replacement, whether it's him or uh, And some of our investigators, uh, are probably our average age is well into the 50s of our uh, scene investigators. Uh, Dolly Olthoff uh, just retired, or is in the process of retiring. I think she's worked her last day. Uh, and we did hire a replacement for her, who's a young woman who's uh, very enthusiastic and hardworking, and we're hoping to continue the administrative uh, uh, procedures uh, as we have uh, before. And as I mentioned, the drug overdose problem is just incredible, and a lot of ME offices around the country are getting, uh, are very short budget-wise because of the increase, uh, because of A, a flat increase in the number of overdose deaths, and then the complexity of doing the toxicology is very expensive. And that's it. Any questions? Thank you, Dr. Cole. Are there questions? Commissioner Ponstein. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for all your work, because I know the average person on the street thinks that, like CSI, you guys can do your job in an hour and have everyone take care of. When it, I mean, you had stated that you investigate sudden and unexpected deaths. So let's just say someone walks into their house and there's a dead body. What is the protocol from there? Is it the local uh, police unit that's going to make the decision whether it's going to be escalated? Do they send the body to the hospital, to the funeral home, or? Right. What is the protocol? Yeah, the process, to, yes, uh, the algorithm. So if somebody walks into a house and, or, uh, and finds somebody dead, it often may be a relative that they haven't heard from. Uh, and they'll, because uh, they're a little anxious, understandably, about finding their brother or sister or somebody dead, they'll call the police for a well-being check. But at any rate, if they just walk into the house and there's mom dead on the floor, the first thing they're gonna, they should do, and I think most people do, is they're gonna call 911. That'll, call, that'll get a police officer there, and probably at the same time, an ambulance. 
if the person's de determined to be dead very clearly right there, then they have to call a medical examiner because we're, we're to be called on every unexpected death. And, and frankly, I didn't, it doesn't really say this in our report, we get hundreds of calls every year on deaths that legally didn't have to be reported, but if it's a hospital or, or a nursing home and they're just not sure, then they'll call and it's better to do that than to, for us to miss one. But, so yeah, they would call the police. The, pol the, the police, it's not their discretion. They're not death investigators per se. They're homicide investigators maybe, but, but we're the ones who do the medical end of it and they call us and we would then work with them and the, the physician if there is one and determine what to do. But, a lot of times in a case like that, we would bring the body into our morgue, which is another intermediate step, even if they don't need an autopsy. We will, it's a holding procedure while we're gathering information. Well, thank you for your work. It's Thanks. fascinating, but not something I'd want to do. <laughs> well, that gives me job security. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner, anything? Commissioner Melton. Thank you, Chair. Um, you talked about education for your uh, co-workers to learn more about the drug epidemic. Um, Chris Becker actually had reached out to uh, my husband and I to talk about coming into the schools and actually beginning to educate. Is this something that you might do? I mean, and I'm not suggesting that Chris wouldn't know, but certainly you see the, the end result, if you will. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not suggesting with your staff, but how am I asking this? Is there is there something that that schools could do, the community could do, or we as commissioners could do to help better educate our constituents and certainly our students as to what is going on with the I mean this fentanyl. I mean I have a nursing background and it just never ever dawned on me that we would see it out on the street. Um, it's very concerning. That is a, well, it's not only a local, and it definitely is a local problem as well as national. Um, I, off the top of my head, I mean, we don't, part of our mission and so on and funding doesn't include programs like that, but both uh, Dr. Start and I have given <coughs> lectures in some schools. Their junior achievement okay. uh, has a program, it's mostly career oriented, right. but I've uh, given some talks to students, particularly at City High or City Middle, uh, in that regard. So th there's, uh, we do some lectures. What we do, and there's discussion of drug overdoses, but as far as a focused mm -hmm. drug prevention problem, uh, I mean, I think if uh, if there is an, an interest in that, oh, I'm sure. uh, there that we could. I mean, I, I, I have a lecture which includes a lot of drug. Uh, scene photographs and so on. Uh, our office, uh, through Carmen, who's our office administrator, um, has data on uh, you know what the, how many and what kind of drug overdoses we're having. Okay. So there's several ways, and um, I can give you my office number if you want to call or someone wants to call and discuss. But, but uh, that's something you might entertain or yeah, or, okay. sure, wonderful. Well, because it, it, although education isn't part of our legal responsibility. I think it's uh, because of the unique uh, information and data that we have, uh, you know, I think we could, uh, we'd be glad to help. And, and it's a problem. It's a public health issue. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Bukowski. All right. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you um, for coming out. Um, and thank you for not bringing your photographs from your other presentations. I saw them at the Rotary Club, and I'll leave it at that. Um, the uh, I don't doubt that, that you do operate at a high quality um, level and, and the quote at the very beginning that you, know, you are judged one of the, one of the best in the nation. Um, so very happy and proud to read that. Um, however, are there a, additional quality measures you could put into your reports in future years? Because everything is kind of a, um, it, it is, a is an output measure. And, and just like the turnaround times as opposed to, you know, how do you measure the quality of your reports? It's great that you're there 95% of the time within an hour, but do the sheriffs roll their eyes or are they happy to see it because they know you're going to do it? And, and again, what's the quality of the report getting done within those months as well as the, the very significant impact because while we aren't the finance committee, 
I at least hear your request for some additional resources. And, and so what's the impact if it takes months to get this stuff done? You know, is it, you know? So all, all that being said is like to, to help, help us understand better the, how do you prove your quality yep. and what is that impact on prosecutors, families, whomever, so. Well, as the uh, attorneys would say in court, that's a multi-partite question, but <laughs> yes, it is. quality. Um, I suppose to look at it is <laughs> by having the, the fox guard the hen house because there's only two of us that do the reports as far as locally. So, you know, I think what I do is pretty good. If you ask me, I'll say, yeah, it's fine. But what are the external, uh, at which is, there's no, here's one way, here's one approach to that. We have the accreditation process where an inspector comes and reviews quite a few reports. This is someone from, has nothing to do with us, another medical examiner. So that's one uh, significant um, way where I could say, well, you know, somebody that doesn't have any dog in the hunt says we're doing well. Um, the question arises, or another way to look at it was, well, who's reading our reports? Um, certainly if it's a criminal case, uh, not only the prosecution and the police, but the defense reads them, and the defense often does and certainly can use an expert. So um, though I don't have any numbers for this, I don't know if the prosecutor's office does, from time to time, you know, we've had uh, folks, there's the Oakland County Medical Examiner is, shall we say, quite active in going around the state and testifying against uh, other medical examiners, and he has come here several times. He's been on the losing side. <laughs> so now that's a small measure, but that is another way where others read our reports. Um, I think uh, having, and again, correct me if I'm going too far afield, and I don't know how much time we have here anyway, but um, with the drug overdose scenario, uh, if uh, there, again, the, the U47700, one of the fentanyl analogs, uh, a case where that was very successful, and I guess the facts speak for themselves, is this was a case we didn't know what was going on with this person, but there was this powder found at the scene. Powder's brought into our office. We had our lab analyze it. Turns out it's this U47700. We, we patient's blood for that because we can't t test someone's blood for just every known possible drug. There's, it's too it's hugely expensive and there wouldn't be enough blood. So, so that's why we do our routine testing and then we kind of hold off and see if there's uh, you know, any evidence or any reason to check for any other drugs. Well, in this case, it, there was a hit. And so that, would, I would say, the, our process worked. Uh, a, a routine lab or the way we did things 10, 15 years ago, we would, if it were drug, we'd have a negative drug screen and no way to do anything about it, no way to, to to see if it really is an overdose or is it some other subtle cause of death. So uh, the process has worked in a number of those cases where we've been able to confirm uh, by, and, and it's, it, I think part of it is, I guess, experience, knowing that these drugs are out there and knowing what ways are there for us to, to get at this thorny problem helps. If you get somebody right out of training, they might not have any idea why do now. Well, uh, so we do have that. Uh, my partner and I, uh, when we have a, either a very difficult case or a homicide case, we each review the other's report uh, to make sure, so it's just going over it. Uh, so we do have that quality control measure for the homicide cases. Um, and some of the drug, or some of the uh, natural deaths, again, it's hard to measure, but I would say this. We get somebody that dies, whether it's a more common cause, such as these, uh, or whether it's an unusual cause of death that, that might also be inherited because the tendency to develop heart disease, of course, uh, oftentimes runs in families, uh, then we are, we've been able to alert families to the fact that they are at risk for whatever disease it is that we found and that they should be checked. And if it's genetic testing, insurance companies now will pay for genetic screening for certain disorders. So. I guess there's, there's that uh, way of looking at it, but there's no overview, I guess to finally answer the question or to answer it in the biggest uh, scenario, there is no like statewide or national agency that say that reviews every report and 
says you know how good it is. It's kind of the results, I guess, looking out the other end, how, how uh, what happens, and are, are we are our findings, particularly in a uh, fentanyl analog case where there's a distributor and the police want to uh, the prosecutor, prosecutor <coughs> the, the uh, dealer, you know, uh, our information obviously is crucial to that to prove that the person did die of an overdose and did not die of anything else. So, but you can rephrase that again. If, no, I'm, I'll try I'm to good answer. for this morning, so thank you. <laughs> sure. All right. All right, any other questions? Commissioner Stack. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. Uh, one follow-up question on the metrics. Um, the three months target for determining cause and manner of death, is, is that a target that is worked in conjunction with the prosecutor's office and the sheriff's department? In other words, does it fit their profile of what they need? Well, here, here's the best answer you have to ask them. But, but I, it, because, because, you know, we do the best we can. And here's, I'll tell you the way I try to work it. Um, for the most part, I think it does, but there's a case now where there was a road rage incident, and it was probably about a month ago, a shooting, where a young guy got shot. And I don't know if it's gonna be prosecuted, but, but the prosecutor reviews all such cases, even if it's self, even if you're protecting yourself or a policeman that shoots somebody and kills them because they're gonna kill somebody else. That's a homicide, by definition. Uh, and the prosecutor has to review it. So in the road rage case, it's a, it's a month old, not very old in, in the big scheme of things in terms of turning around my report. But I'm going to finish that. So when they do ask for a particular case, uh, that one's going to get moved front because there's obviously an urgency. Or families, as far as that's concerned, if they have a need uh, to file an insurance policy or an insurance claim, I should say, um, you know, if they call, usually they call our office or they call Carmen, and because the funeral homes you know, know that that's, those are the routes to get these reports done. So we try to respond uh, on cases where there's more, uh, uh, where someone is indicating more urgency. So maybe this is not the right term, but you triage your cases. Um, yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Do, again, basically, uh, I know this is not exciting, <laughs> but the way I operate is my oldest case, like when I, if I have time to sit down today, and there are days when I don't have any time to sit down and go through cases, I need some uninterrupted time so I can read through them and finish them and look at all the data. But um, if I have time to do that this afternoon, what I'll do is I usually start with my oldest case, besides the one that I've been asked to finish for the road bridge. But other than that, if there's nobody asking for anything else, I start with these, which I'm now about eight weeks out, so I'm, I'm doing okay right now. But I'll start with the oldest one, finish that, because that makes sense, get rid of the oldest word first. But then the ones that get put ahead are the ones where somebody's asking. All right, any other questions? I have one final question. On page five of your um, presentation today, regarding the percentage of autopsies within three months, uh, you mentioned that we're seeing a spike in deaths and we're seeing the, the number of deaths, I, I assume it's the 300 range don't really reflect that is it um, and then also so can you address that and then my second question is are we tracking deaths based on drug overdose and if not can we start and can your next presentation include that because I think it is important um, for potential grants in the future or anything that we may seek yeah. to have that information thank you okay well that's again another several part question so I'll try to make sure we get on all of them uh, tracking uh, as far as what deaths and what are the drugs, the answer is we do that. Uh, uh, we produce an annual report. Okay. And I mean, it's also something that certainly I can incorporate yeah, you know, into this uh, uh, presentation next year. But but we do do that, and it's and if it's in the form of our annual report. Okay. Um, so there's that. Uh, overall autopsy numbers, I don't know this year. I haven't. We, what we do is we do autopsies for Kent and a number of other counties. Uh, all I know is, as we did case number 231 uh, for the year, which is probably roughly about what we did total last year, I haven't sorted out the Kent cases. But I would say we may not have, well, I don't know if we've had a huge spike in Kent cases, but the main problem is the complexity okay. as far as the turnaround time. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Thank you for your time today sure. and your presentation. All right, on to item six, Bureau of Equalization. I'd like to bring up Matt Walford um, to talk about their performance measure. Thank you.
Good morning. How are you today? Well, it's very rare that uh, that my topic is a little bit more lighthearted, uh, but uh, we'll uh, we'll try and go we'll try and go through that. The mission of the Bureau of Equalization is to provide for a fair system of assessment and taxation, and to provide professional services for all the cities and townships in King County. We do that through three main strategic goals. Uh, each one of these goals is aligned with. Uh, priority alignment. Two of them are under stable revenues, which makes sense uh, in terms of the revenue side. And the third, relating to our remonumentation program, uh, reflecting on high quality of life. The first strategic goal is to annually project the property values and study the level of assessment uh, by property class through appraisal studies and or sales studies and apply equalization factors if necessary to bring them into compliance with state law. Our second goal is to provide professional mapping services for all of the land in Kent County. And the reason that we do this and the reason that the county elected to form the property description and mapping is to make sure that all land that is subject to the property tax is taxed once and is not subjected to double -tions. So we put the puzzle pieces together. We make sure there's no gaps and overlaps in the uh, parcel fabric. Our third main strategic goal is to preserve the public survey monuments for public use for the PLSS system. And that is the, uh, the monuments that we've talked about on several occasions. Uh, you're never more than a half mile away from a government monument in Kent County. It's truly a program of distinction that the county had the foresight some 30, 40 years ago to uh, come about. And there's over 4,000 monuments in the, today here in Kent County. I would uh, call out to you that uh, the, under the first strategic goal, uh, under the FAIR system, we are responsible and the board is responsible for two main reports each year. First one is the summary of equalized values and taxable values through the equalization report, which we provide to you in April and May. The second one is through the mandated apportionment report, which is the millage side of your, on behalf of the Board of Commissioners that all of the taxing authorities in Kent County are levying their millages not to exceed the provisions of the Headley Amendment. So we make sure on the one hand that the valuations are done fairly and on the other hand that the millage rates are calculated and being um, levied under appropriate state law provisions. Our significant accomplishments in this year uh, we just completed our aerial <coughs> photography project. Uh, we are now moving towards a three-year cycle where we uh, take what's uh, commonly known as sort of the bird's eye view, uh, photographs of the county. This is shared with all of the uh, cities and townships and various county departments. It's used in public safety. It's used uh, by all of the local government units for all of their needs. And so that has been completed. Uh, we just completed that here this spring. There will be another flight that will be coming up in 2020. So we're happy to be in partnership with the local land. We uh, also, in this last year, we continue to lead in the development of um, computer-assisted mass appraisal standards. Uh, this is something that we have uh, helped promote throughout the state, uh, which is essentially the standardization of uh, our appraisal related fields and that's uh, been a successful endeavor as well. Related to that is uh, we have been sharing information and helped in the development of the statewide parcel repository and I think we're over a dozen uh, volunteering uh, sharing the data between and amongst ourselves and with the state of Michigan. And finally just in terms of noting accomplishments we again housed this year we housed two Calvin uh, College GIS interns they worked in three separate departments. They worked in equalization, they worked in the parks, and they worked uh, in community development, and we were happy to, to house them as well. Specifically to the uh, departmental measurements, uh, I'd be happy to any specific questions that you may have. I know mine is uh, five minutes, so I'd be happy to go into any detail that you would like through your questions. Thank you, ma'am. Any questions for Matt today? Thank you, Chair Poulter. Thanks for being here today. Thank you. Uh, you had briefly touched on the aerial uh, mapping. And yes. That's a great asset to assessors because they can take a quick view of 
there's been an addition or some improvements to the property. There had been talk a few years back that the next step would the 3D mapping like Google Maps does of the neighborhood so you'd get the front view of the house too. Do you see that ever replacing the aerial mapping and everything's going to be done on the ground? Well, uh, 3D mapping has come quite a long way. In fact, if you were to just look on Google or Apple Maps today, you would see the Grand Rapids metropolitan area as one of the larger metropolitans uh, has a lot of sort of 3D views on that. The, the 3D modeling is very rough still. It gives you, uh, I don't know how to say, it's not very precise is, is the word I'm looking for. So it gives you sort of a, a feel for what it's like in, in the real world, but the oblique imagery is at a three inch pixel resolution and I don't see the 3D uh, replacing that anytime soon. Uh, I think it's kind of a both and scenario. Uh, we may at some point in the future choose to contract high precision 3D mapping done, but I don't anticipate that within the next few contract cycles. Okay. Thank you. All right, any other questions for Matt today? Mr. Smith? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think we talked about this before, but is the uh, aerial photography that the county does, is it a better resolution than, than available on Google Earth or, or Bing Maps? Yes. Uh, most, more importantly, however, is, is the suite of uh, tools and measurement tools. The ability to measure height with a degree of precision, the ability to measure area, the ability to measure distances, and uh, the sheer number of photos that you receive would be the distinction between governments like us that choose to procure that as opposed to looking sort of to the imagery that's generally available to the public. Is your new photography online already? or? Uh, no. Uh, it, the the top-down versions of it are being reviewed right now. We, we just accepted delivery, I think, hmm, about a month ago. And so once we have that top-down view uh, resolved, we're working with the ITGIS team. Uh, we're exploring ways to get that top-down version out there online. Uh, then can you just talk a little bit about uh, the first significant accomplishment, just where are you in the analysis of the, uh, of the process with Allegan County, Montcalm County? Ah, yes. Uh, we we uh, recently, we just amended the contract with Allegan County. Our contract with Montcalm County will be expiring in December of this year. I've been in a number of discussions with really all three county administrators uh, talking about what I believe is the uh, key strategic goals in bringing those data sets together. Once, and so there's a series of discussions with both the IT departments and the administrators on that. Once we sort of get through that, because that's where I really think some of the secret sauce is going to be, once we have that data together, and we truly are able to work more at a unified three counties as opposed to us just doing three things the same way in three different occasions, I'll have a much better view of that and we're going to take that experience and what we do, come back and work with all three administrators and sort of uh, take a look at the allocation of time and resources between the three. I anticipate that happening in the later in the third quarter and fourth quarter of this year. Yeah, my sense is that as you begin to work more and more together like this, it's, it's going to be hard to disentangle it later and the end game is, is a degree of, uh, of cooperation and integration of these activities. Is that fair? I think so. Yeah. Once you once you start to weave something together, um, it seems like uh, it, it becomes more of a tear if you pull it apart, right? So um, that's something I'm conscious of, um, and that, that's something how can we consciously disentangle this if we choose to, if it's in any one of the three counties' interest to do so. Um, I look at it as there's no risk, no reward type of scenario in that regard. Going to collaborate or we're not, and the ties that bind are, are really kind of important for me to achieve the efficiencies from both a data perspective and a personnel perspective. And uh, But that is definitely something that we wrestle with, but I think we can construct it in such a way that the interests of Kent County will be preserved and we'll have a good exit strategy for one and all of the three counties as we move forward. At least at this point, you see no reason to slow that process down. You know, I don't. I think really, I think that we're we're really only beginning to truly achieve the benefits operationally uh, that these types of collaborations can offer. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Matt, for your excellent work in, in keeping the roles in order and all that stuff. Um, similar question, though, to the met as I asked the medical examiner, you know, what are the quality measures? Mm -hmm. And um, the the report doesn't say like when um, or do you get brought into the hearings before, like when somebody checks their tax assessment. Sure. And then um, is that one place <coughs> we can at least measure a win and loss? to say, you know, are your appraisals getting overturned more than others or are they being upheld more than others? But yeah, so sure. go for that tripartite question. Well, you know, one of the primary distinctions between an, the assessor's offices throughout the county, which there are 30, and our office is that uh, we, are, we are the ones who set projected true cash value each year for the assessors to meet. So in essence, we're the ones who sort of set the target. Uh, we, through our appraisal studies and through our sales studies, we say we believe that the market conditions have changed plus or minus X percent in your particular unit. And beyond that, in this particular class of property in this particular city or township. So our measures of our study work are, what we do is we send that out to the users and we go through sort of a reconciliation. We have, their, I, I always say their ticket of admission is an appropriate land study, an appropriate economic condition factor study, where they come in and they sort of look at the results of our study and then we, we consider their information, we add our information in, and then we sort of finalize things. What's that, once that target is final, it becomes the purview of the local assessor now to raise the individual assessments on individual properties and such, the appeals of those assessments is wholly contained at the local unit within the city or township. So we don't get directly involved in, in the appellate process and how the assessors uh, defend those assessments. <coughs> Where we get involved in the defense of assess values is when assessors reach out to us for our specific market expertise, particularly in commercial and industrial, and we will expand and enhance their research preparations for their Michigan Tax Tribunal defenses. For instance, we've done a, a, an analysis on the big box uh, dark stores phenomenon. We've shared that with the assessors, we've shared that with the state, and, and uh, uh, talked extensively with Representative Matern on that. So we get involved to the analytical side and to the uh, supporting the local assessors in their defense work, but we are, uh, we are typically not directly involved in the defense of the individual assessments on an annual basis. All right, thank you. Mr. Skates. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, I served on a board of review for five years. I appreciate all the work that you guys do. Um, you. One thing that I'm hoping that you can uh, comment on, uh, speaking of uh, collaboration, is uh, the importance of making sure that those board of review members are, are well trained. And I remember going to a training Correct. many years ago. Um, are we still doing those to, to make sure that that part of the puzzle is uh, ensuring that we have some fair and accurate uh, assessments for our taxpayers? Yeah, it's, uh, yes, is the short answer. Uh, there's typically an annual training. That annual training can either be conducted directly by myself in some instances. Uh, it's sponsored by our local assessors associations. The Michigan Townships Association offers training. Uh, so there's a variety of, of methods. Uh, it's not always the exact same. Mm -hmm. We often have uh, board of review members that are, that serve in long-term capacities, <coughs> and so having the same training over and over. We try to uh, add uh, different aspects of, of the process <coughs> into some of the trainings, but that is something that is a conscious effort uh, to try and do on an annual basis. Great. That's appreciated. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> All right. Any other questions for Matt today? Seeing none, thank you, Matt. Thank you. All right, moving on to item seven of our agenda, miscellaneous. Thank you, Chair. After our CIP discussion this morning, I had a comment and I thought I'd hold it to this meeting. I talked to Jim on the way over about it. A number of years ago, the Parks Committee was underneath the Roads Commission, and then they operated on their own sense with the director and staff. And there's many items on here for parks. There's 10 items, 10 or more, 20 items on here. 
and not all of them have a father or mother. They're just sort of out there, and we all like parks, and we all want to be a part of parks, and, uh, but when it comes up on the CIP, it's left up to staff. Years ago, I supported a parks committee for the county, and for whatever reason, that never took place, but we have a new board here today, and a different board than we had when I was here 10 years ago. But uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity to be a part of the parks, and it doesn't, I don't want it to be a hindrance, I want it to be an asset to the county as the boards that we've had in the past, whether it be the airport board. Dan's returned to the airport board. I think it's been a seamless transition for Dan as, as he comes back and sees the direction that the board is going in today has probably not changed a whole lot from when he was there before. And then we had director changes. We've had the same at the road commission. The director says, Oh, we're going to go to a five-member board from a three-member board. How's that going to work? Is that going to work for me? And he had all up concerned and whatnot. But I think the process, process to have a five-member board is way better than to have a, a three-member board. And I, say, I think the same for the parks. I think they should have a board. I think they should have support here. Parks needs friends. They need friends from they needs friends from the residents. But they need friends from the internal part to our part. And uh, so when these situations arrive, maybe they do need restrooms this year. I know one time I was riding uh, my bike and I was up uh, at Wabas's and uh, I see they're repaving, repaving Wabas's lane. I talked to park truckers, well, we don't have funds for that. I talked to uh, uh, John Rice at the time and he saw, take a look at it and he dropped in 40 foot of pavement on that overlook at Wabas's Park. Today they've got some cinder gravel that they put in there additionally. But back then, if we had a parks commission, hey, why don't you just go pave it and then we'll go to Daryl and let him at his head. And Daryl can make it, make it work because uh, sometimes committees do that to Daryl. That's how he earns his money. So. But then I take it from somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, well, we don't tell the other people where you took it from. That's, that's the important part. But uh, anyway, that's uh, a comment. and. Uh, you know, what's the priority? And, and Roger brought up that side issue. That goes back to Dan and me early years. Most of you never heard of that before. You know, and, and the trailers and whatnot, some of these things aren't getting done because they need some friends and they need friends on this board, this board and, and the full board. So that's my comment and let the chair and the vice chair uh, hash that over and the board members can uh, think about it and make comments. So that's my comment for today. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other miscellaneous today? Um, just to uh, uh, point out that this is the uh, 29th annual um, Grand Rapids Pride Festival just outside of our building. Um, so come on downtown to support our LGBTQ brothers and sisters and cousins and nephews. Speaking of nephews, I had a proud moment last night. My nephew Eric did some awesome community organizing, a few hundred people um, downtown right outside of the um, being remodeled Veterans Park. Uh, it was the first anniversary of the unfortunate event in Orlando at the Pulse nightclub. So people down there for a memorial service and very proud that my nephew, uh, former Commissioner Bolkowski's son, um, organized that. So that's tomorrow. Um, and I know he didn't make a motion, but I'd be happy to have further conversations along the line that Commissioner Vonk just talked about. How are we as a commission truly supporting our parks? And um, I'd be very, very open to those conversations. So thank you all. Any other commissioner miscellaneous today? I just have one. We have a, a vacancy on the Ag Board, and we did receive applications. So since we just wrapped up some other uh, vacancy uh, positions and filling those, I'm going to ask Commissioner Brady and Commissioner Steck to join me again in a, a, a small subcommittee just to um, review those Ag Board um, applications. We'll be making that announcement as soon as we can. Any other things for today? If not, we are adjourned. Safe streets, 
vibrant neighborhoods, successful business and commerce. These are things that make a healthy community. We are a diverse community, rural, suburban, urban, a multitude of languages and ethnicities, ages and experiences. We are a collaborative community. Public-private partnerships make us a model community that others want to follow. It is what makes us unique. It is what makes us strong. The employees of Kent County reflect our diversity and seek to serve our communities. People in this county, in this area, we wrap our arms around each other. We come together to collaborate, to solve problems. Um, we're all working for the good of the whole. And I think that's wonderful. And you can see it. You can see it as you drive around Kent County. Our impact starts the day a baby is born and a birth certificate is issued, to protecting children from deadly diseases through vaccination, to the public safety and justice provided by law enforcement and the courts, to offering veteran services and caring for the elderly. Every day we work to keep our communities robust. I think if you are somebody who is interested in serving your community, in building a strong knowledge base and a good group of people to work with, then the county is one of your best employment opportunities out there. It's been completely rewarding in every way I could possibly explain for 26 years, and I feel like I grow every single day still today. Leading these dedicated employees are 19 member board of commissioners and our county administrator controller, along with our elected officials and appointed department directors, placing emphasis on civic involvement, quality housing, vibrant neighborhoods, and strong, solid infrastructure to allow businesses to thrive. Professional, dedicated, collaborative, and innovative. Behind the scenes, collaboration between foundations, charitable organizations, nonprofits, for-profit businesses, public sector demonstrated through the county, the city of Grand Rapids, the townships, all the cities and the villages in our area. If we don't come together, then we will not have the strength that we have today, and I only hope to build upon that. Our aim is to make our communities the best they can be. We are involved in exciting development projects, sustainable recycling programs, and creative progressive prevention programming. We partner with elected officials, impacting policy ideas that become great achievements. We seek opportunities to reach out into the community and offer our services to help our residents make Kent County thrive. Our relationship um, is solid, um, both from a staff standpoint at the county level, as well as the Board of Commissioners. And um, they understand what we do and the benefits that we can do for the community. And vice versa, we couldn't do what we do without the help of Kent County. While most of us are busy running our lives, Kent County's elected officials, administrator controller, and over 1,600 employees are serving the communities where we live our lives so we can all have a place we are proud to call home. Kent County, it's life well run.